This is Martha Nowak, and I'm welcoming you to the Cases and Careers in Veterinary Medicine. We have today with us Dr. Sarah Kaufman. She's a clinical assistant professor at the Small Animal Clinic or the Animal Clinic at uh, K-State Manhattan. So she should be able to answer some questions for you at the conclusion of the lecture. She is, um, she did earn her Bachelor of Science in Geology at the College of Women Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. She earned her MBA at Colorado State University. And then she went back for her uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine or VVM Veterinary School at Colorado State. And she believes in comprehensive wellness, including oral health hence the dentistry um, topic for today, uh, nutritional counseling, dermatology, and internal medicine. So uh, we're glad to have you joining us today, and I will turn it over at this point to Dr. Kaufman. Thanks, Martha. Well, I'm going to start out just by telling you a little bit about me, because I understand that you're uh, at a point in learning where you're starting to maybe think about specializing. I know some of you are in a program in your high school specific to animal health. And just to tell you a little bit about um, my schooling and academic background and different things that I tried and discovered maybe they weren't for me. Um, so I, I did go to college in Virginia at William & Mary, which is a small state school. And I was a geology major there, so did a lot of basic sciences, you know, did my chemistry courses and physics and calculus, um, but really didn't have any interest in biology at the time. Um, graduated from William and Mary and got an offer for basically a scholarship with a salary to go be a graduate student in geology at the University of Notre Dame. And I thought, well, that's great. If somebody is going to pay me to keep going to school, this sounds like a good deal for me. So I went to that program and, and got really down um, into studying uh, rocks and minerals on a molecular level. So doing some research with um, what's called single crystal x-ray diffraction. I was using a particle accelerator to do some research projects over in Chicago at a national laboratory and you know I was learning lots of things but not a very happy person because of the lack of social interaction that I had it was very um, individual work you know lots of going into the lab to monitor my experiments in the middle of the night and um, doing important projects but didn't really get a sense of fulfillment there and decided um, that I needed to look elsewhere and actually left that program without completing my PhD and, and moved to Colorado just on somewhat of a whim and started working at a veterinary hospital because I always had liked animals and it seemed like um, a fun job and started that job not really knowing that it was going to turn into a career for me. And I lived in Western Colorado and um, worked at a clinic that saw all types of animals. We saw pigs and goats and sheep and cows and horses and rabbits and cats and dogs and a little bit of everything under the sun at all hours of the day and night. Um, and I loved it. And lucky for me, I, I picked a state that had a great veterinary program. And I was also having this experience while working at this veterinary hospital, um, watching kind of the business aspect of that hospital and working for doctors that I had high regard for for their medical skill and seeing them struggle with being business managers as well. Uh, and when I applied to Colorado State, they had this option of doing my master's in business administration at the same time I was getting my doctor in veterinary medicine. So I, I did a five-year program for veterinary school, which is a little bit different from your usual course of veterinary school. Usually veterinary school is four years, um, but I took an extra year as part of this combined program and uh, basically I was a veterinary student during the day and I went to business school at night and then after five years finished both degrees. Um, but that program also allowed me um, to have some different work experiences. So um, I, I worked as a lab tech in one of the, uh, the clinical pathology labs. So clinical pathology means 
uh, running blood work and looking at um, cytology slides. So looking at slide samples of different uh, masses or fluids or things like that. We did some um, blood banking. So we did blood typing and cross-matching for patients that needed blood transfusion. So I got to have a lot of different experiences as part of that program and, and also opened up a lot of different career opportunities to me outside of private practice. So um, I graduated from Colorado State in 2008 and um, Hills Pet Nutrition, which is a local Kansas company here. Um, they're based out of Topeka. You may be familiar with them. They make science diet and prescription diet pet foods. Uh, but they were really interested in having veterinarians work for their company uh, that had a business background. And so I went to work for Hills right out of school. And again, got to have lots of different learning experiences with Hills. I worked in their marketing department, what they called professional marketing, where we um, figured out how best to talk to other veterinarians about the company's products. I also did some field sales where um, I actually went out and um, was able to visit about 200 veterinary hospitals. I had to visit every two months and talk to them about our different nutritional products and educate them, educate their employees just on nutrition in general. Um, but after a couple of years of working in the corporate environment, I really missed the clinical work with animals. And so I, I left Hills and decided to go into private practice. So um, I, for a while, I was what they call a normal veterinarian. Um, so your regular everyday vet that you take your dog or cat to, to get a checkup. And I did work at a, a couple of different clinics in Johnson County. So may have been close by to where you all are, are living right now. Um, I also worked in Douglas County in Lawrence. And then um, after several years working in private practice, developed the special interest in dentistry and went out and got some extra training there. So I think part of my personal employment journey and uh, career journey has been this idea that I'm learning continuously. And I think that's really, really important in science. Um, we're continuously making new discoveries and learning new techniques and um, learning about new ways to do things all the time. And I think it's really important if you're someone that's interested in science that you're committed to this continuous learning that goes on. And uh, that's been just kind of an explosion for me being here at K-State because there are so many different things going on here at the university and within the College of Veterinary Medicine. If I'm curious about any particular topic anywhere from small animal medicine um, to you know large animal reproductive technology. All I have to do is walk down the hall and, and some of the world's experts are right here. Um, so what I do every day at K-State, um, my 75% of my job is what we call clinical teaching. So that means I work with veterinary students who are in their fourth year of school. So veterinary school involves the first three years are mostly classroom learning. And then the fourth year, the students are with us faculty members in the hospital seeing um, owned pets. So people bring their pets to us for treatment. Uh, so primarily I'm working with fourth year students in the clinic and doing what we call small animal general medicine. So a lot of that is annual exams and preventative health care like vaccinations, heartworm testing. Um, we treat minor illnesses and injuries like I might see a dog who got a cut or a laceration and sedated and, and do stitches and have a student help me with that. Um, but we do an awful lot of annual wellness care for dogs and cats. And then, um, of course, I also work in small animal dentistry, um, doing lots of different procedures for dogs and cats that have different types of dental disease. And uh, last but not least, I also do some classroom teaching, so more traditional teaching um, in business and veterinary practice management. So there's some courses that are, um, some that are required, some that are elective, so some that students can choose to take that look at different business aspects of veterinary medicine and I help teach those courses as well. All right, so before I start talking about veterinary dentistry, what I wanna know from all of you who are listening, uh, if you wanna type in the chat box, what kind of pets you have at home? 
Um, and I'm just kind of curious how many pet owners I have in the audience versus just people who are our future pet doctors. Okay. Oh, lots of dog owners. Okay. Ooh, we got a dog, a cat, and a hamster. We do have a great exotics program here at K-State. Uh, we get a lot of students who are interested in that. Ooh, and we've got a snake too, also an exotic. So I, I see um, dogs and cats. Oh, we got a parrot and a horse too, okay. So in dentistry, I deal strictly with dogs and cats, but we have other doctors here who specialize. We have three faculty members in our exotics, and then we also have um, an intern. So an intern is someone who has graduated from veterinary school and is a licensed veterinarian, uh, but they're seeking uh, extra training in a specific area. So we do have an exotics intern position here at K-State, and obviously we have um, very active equine hospital as well. But I'm gonna to talk today about dogs and cats. So what got me interested in dental disease? Uh, one thing that became immediately obvious to me when I started in small animal general practice is that you will see a lot of it. And dental disease is actually the most common diagnosis in small animal medicine. Um, so unfortunately, obesity is, is running a pretty close second there because we see a lot of dogs and cats that are overweight, um, but somewhere in the realm of 70 to 80% of dogs and cats are walking around with dental disease. So I am never at a lack for patients that need my help. Dental disease can really be a source of chronic pain that I feel is often overlooked. It's a source of bacterial infection in the body and chronic inflammation in the body. And, and there've been some good studies lately that have come out in the last three or four years looking at the links between untreated dental disease and lifespan. And we're starting to have some good scientific evidence now that getting regular dental treatment for your dog can actually prolong their lifespan. So I'm very, very pleased that we finally have some, some scientific proof that, that that's true because I've believed that for a very long time. Um, dentistry in the past has been something that we haven't had a lot of time or curriculum devoted to in veterinary school when I went through school, which was just 12 or 13 years ago that I graduated. Um, I, I didn't have a dentistry clinical rotation at all. So I didn't get any hands-on practice with dentistry until after I graduated and went out and sought that, that education on my own. So many veterinarians don't have the training to treat dental disease. And so frequently it's not treated as well as to the extent that it should be. So there are a lot of animals out there that aren't getting the care that they need. And the reason that I love dentistry is that if you appropriately treat a patient with dental disease, you will make an immediate improvement in your patient's quality of life. I see dogs and cats all the time that have lived with oral pain for years. And you treat that by either extracting a tooth or doing another procedure and they immediately feel better. And it's just so satisfying to see patients and, and clients come back and say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize what a big deal with the, this was. I thought my dog was just getting older, but now that you've treated his dental pain, he's acting like a puppy again. And I just, I love that um, immediate impact on my patient's quality of life. So have any of you ever had a tooth that either got broken or, you know, young people sometimes have had an accident where you fell and you broke broke teeth, or maybe, um, I hope no one has had the experience of having to have a root canal because they've had a broken tooth, but has anybody ever had that kind of oral pain before, tooth pain? It, it's really, really awful. Um, people who have broken teeth, uh, they, they usually don't wait very long. If they have the ability to get to a dentist, um, they get there right away. And our dogs and our cats, they are, are so good at hiding pain that they, they don't give external signs that people understand all the time. Uh, so it, it's really the veterinarian's job to go looking 
for disease in the mouth. And I say dental disease, there's lots of different things that I'm grouping under this heading of dental disease. So we can have something called periodontal disease. So if any of you have studied your Latin root words yet, um, so that dont, the D-O-N-T, that refers to a tooth and perio means around. So periodontal disease is disease of the tissues around a tooth. So that's like your gums or the bone that's holding the tooth in the socket. Um, you can have endodontic disease. So dont again is your tooth and endo is inside. So inside your teeth is a nerve and blood vessel. Um, that's something we call the pulp cavity of the tooth. So you can have disease of that inside of the tooth or endodontic disease. Uh, a little bit later in the presentation, I'm gonna talk about a process called tooth resorption. I also see patients that have masses or tumors in their mouth, sometimes they're cancer. Um, other times they are benign processes causing masses in the mouth. And we also see an awful lot of trauma cases. So either animals that have bitten down on something and broken a tooth and now they need a root canal to fix that um, or they need the tooth extracted to fix that um, or animals that have been hit by a car or had a fight with another animal. Um, lots of things happen to our dogs and cats that can cause damage to the teeth. So I picked two topics today that I thought would be interesting and things that are really, really common for me to see. And maybe you've had some personal experience with um, one of your own pets with these things. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is dental fractures in dogs. So when I say dental fracture, I'm talking about a broken tooth. I'm not really talking in this case about the bones. So the jaw bones being broken. I'm talking more about the tooth itself being broken. And this is super, super common. Um, so there's some papers out there that estimate 25% of dogs will break a tooth in their lifetime. I personally think it's much, much more than that. I see dogs with broken teeth almost every day. Um, it could be a trauma, like I just mentioned. A lot of dogs break, break their teeth by chewing on inappropriate objects. So one of the things I want you to think about over the next couple of minutes are um, what do people commonly give their dogs that might be breaking their teeth? So I want you to put some ideas into that chat box and then we'll go back and talk about that here in a couple of minutes. Um, but I see an awful lot of dogs with these broken teeth and many of them are in a lot of pain and then some of them will get infection. So we talked about inside the tooth, is a blood vessel, blood vessels and nerves. So this is a very simple diagram of what a tooth looks like um, if you took a cross section. So if you cut a tooth in half and looked at the inside under the microscope, this is what you would see. Uh, so on the outer covering of the tooth in the mouth is enamel. And enamel is the hardest substance in the body. It's even harder than bone. Um, and it's very slick and smooth and glass-like when it's healthy. And underneath the enamel is something called dentin. And dentin makes up more of the thickness of the tooth than the enamel does, but it's a little weaker um, in terms of hardness. And it also is porous. It's filled with these little micro microscopic tubules that bacteria can, can travel through if that dentin becomes exposed into the mouth. And then underneath the dentin in the very center of the tooth is the pulp where the blood supply and the innervation are found. So the nerves provide sensation of pain. They also provide sensation of cold or heat. So if you've ever had um, a tooth that's sensitive when you eat something super hot or super cold, that's because of the nerves in your pulp. But if you were to break open a tooth um, and got down all the way through the dentin into the pulp, teeth can bleed too when they break. Okay, I'm going to look and see here if I've gotten any ideas in my chat box. Uh, 
Oh, oh, here we go. I've got one person. Yes, so we are absolutely correct that um, if people give their dogs real bones, that can absolutely cause broken teeth. Um, so another thing that I see really commonly is really hard nylon chews. So a lot of dogs, especially big dogs, it seems like um, can be pretty aggressive chewers. I have a Great Dane at home and this dog can chew anything. He goes through any toy that I have purchased um, in, in about 30 seconds flat. Um, and that's a really common problem. And so people will continue to buy harder and harder toys for their pet. And maybe it slows them down a little bit, but also frequently what happens is the teeth break. Um, so real bones can lead to your dog breaking their teeth. I see a lot of antlers. So deer antler or elk antler are also inappropriate to give your dog to chew on. It can result in breaking the teeth. So our, we have a literal rule of thumb and you'll have to bear with me because people who like teeth, um, this is human dentists and veterinary dentists alike, we also like bad puns and corny jokes. Um, so one of, one of the cheesy things that we like to say is a rule of thumb. And that means if you take your thumbnail and press it against your dog's toy, it should make a dent. And if you can't indent that toy with your thumbnail, it is too hard to give your dog. So I had a lot of you respond that you have dogs at home. So I want you all to go home or you're, you're at home right now. I want you all after the presentation to um, check your dog's toys that you have laying around the house. And if you can't make a dent in it with your thumbnail, it's probably too hard and your dog could break a tooth and we don't want them to be in pain. Okay, um, so this is kind of a complicated diagram, but this is from the American Veterinary Dental College or AVDC. And so they have a classification scheme for how the tooth can be fractured in different ways. And I'm just gonna point out a couple of things here. So we talked about how the tooth has multiple layers. We've got the enamel, we've got the dentin, and then in the center, we have the pulp. So sometimes we have really superficial fractures and it just affects the enamel. And then we don't necessarily need to do anything about that. Um, I also see a lot of this type of fracture here, that abbreviation UCF means an uncomplicated crown fracture. That means it's into the dentin, but the pulp hasn't been exposed. So then we get into what we call a complicated crown fracture. So complicated means the pulp is exposed and then we've got trouble. Uh, I talk with clients a lot about broken teeth because this is so common. And a lot of times the first response I get is, well, my dog still eats. I, you know, how can he have dental pain? Because if I have dental pain, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wanna eat. Um, dogs and cats, their brains are hardwired more instinctually than ours are. And the other thing that we have done when, and I say we, I mean people, have domesticated dogs. And part of that domestication process is that we have selected for dogs that are motivated by food. So dogs that like to eat are generally more trainable. Um, they're more interested in hanging around people. And over millennia, we have selected for dogs that are just, their brains are hardwired to want to eat. And it doesn't seem to matter what degree of dental pain they have, they will keep eating. So just because your dog is eating normally doesn't mean he doesn't have dental pain. Um, the other thing that I will hear, and sometimes I even hear this from other veterinarians, is like, oh, well that, you know, that tooth's been broken for five years now, so it just must not be a problem. And, and the truth is that we don't know whether or not a broken tooth is causing a problem until we take a dental x-ray. And a tooth that looks relatively normal in the mouth, other than the fracture, if we take an x-ray, we might find problems in the surrounding bone. Um, and sometimes we'll even see infection that starts to affect the skin around the face because the, there's infection coming out around that tooth root. Okay, 
So today I'm going to talk about a case of a complicated dental fracture. So remember I said that a complicated tooth fracture is one that goes all the way down to the pulp. So you can see in this picture here, um, this is a dog's tooth. This is an upper fourth premolar, or what some people will call the carnasial tooth. If you've ever heard somebody say a dog's carnasial tooth, it's this upper fourth premolar. And this pink spot with the arrow pointing to it is that blood vessel and nerve exposed where this tooth has been broken. And you can see that there's this fragment of fractured tooth that is still hanging on there at the gum line. Um, so this pulp exposure is like a super highway for bacteria. As soon as that pulp is open into the mouth, any kind of mouth, I don't care if it's a human mouth, a dog mouth, a cat mouth, a horse mouth, there is a ton of bacteria in the mouth. That is just the nature of the oral cavity. So if we open up blood supply into that mouth, bacteria are gonna be in there immediately. Like within microseconds, we've got bacteria, boom, into that open blood supply. So this very rapidly becomes infected but there's variations on how severely this affects the rest of the body. So sometimes we'll see very localized infections. Uh, sometimes we'll see that the bone right around the root of the tooth becomes weak and infected. And sometimes we even can see what we call septicemia. So septicemia means that there is bacteria in the bloodstream. And believe it or not, that can happen because of a broken and infected tooth. Um, there are cases in human dental literature of people who have died from having a, a tooth that got broken and got infected. And that just makes me so sad to hear things like that. Um, and, and I also don't want that, that to happen to my veterinary patients. I don't, I don't wanna hear about an animal that became septic. Uh, that's, that's the term that we use if they have septicemia, we say the animal is septic um, because they had a broken tooth that didn't get treated appropriately. So these can be very serious problems. So then what do we do? What is appropriate treatment if we have a complicated dental fracture? Um, so the simplest thing typically to do is to extract the tooth. So extraction means we're pulling the tooth. And in many cases, it's totally appropriate for your, your general practice veterinarian to pull teeth. Um, this is a permanent treatment. So if the tooth is completely extracted, we get all of that root tissue out and we get that healed up after surgery, then we never have to worry about it again. However, this can result in the patient not having as functional of a mouth. Uh, so for instance, if a dog breaks its canine tooth, so the canine uh, is what some people will call the fangs of the dog. Well, dogs use those big fangs to pick things up. Uh, so they use those when they pick up balls, when they pick up toys, when they pick up larger food items. Um, if we have to pull the canine teeth on the lower jaw, that those teeth hold the dog's tongue in the mouth. So has anybody ever had a, a dog that had to have teeth pulled and then their tongue hung out of the mouth afterwards? Um, a lot of people don't like to see that. So we can have some cosmetic problems like the tongue hanging out of the mouth, or we can also have um, patients that lose function. And I'm gonna check in the chat here. Uh, okay, we'll keep going here. Um, the other option to preserve the function of the tooth is to do a root canal. Um, and this is something that you may have heard adults joke about like, oh, root canal, this is so horrible. Well, um, in people, unfortunately, we have to be awake when we have a root canal, but um, dogs and cats, we put them all the way under anesthesia. So a root canal is not something that your dog has to be awake through and, and be nervous about. Um, and these are typically performed by board certified veterinary dentists. Um, so what board certified means is that this veterinarian, they went through veterinary school and then they may have done an extra internship year 
and then they went on to do what's called a residency. So a residency is typically three to four years long, and it is special training only in that one area of medicine. So in this case, dentistry. Um, you can do residencies. I want to say there are more than two dozen different veterinary specialties now that have residency options. That includes everything from ophthalmology, um, dentistry, orthopedic surgery, soft tissue surgery, oncology, which is treatment of cancer. Um, there are things like behavior and reproduction and uh, lab animal medicine also have specialty options. So I'm actually not a board certified veterinary dentist. I am a general practitioner that has a special interest in dentistry. Um, but we do have a board certified veterinary dentist that comes to K-State two days a week. So he travels between multiple locations and, and he has a really interesting background because he also has an interest in zoo and wildlife medicine. So he comes to K-State, he treats dogs and cats in the Wichita area and also at a clinic in Arkansas. And then he also travels to several zoos around the state of Kansas. Um, sometimes goes out of state as well to do work at different zoos and has done root canals on elephant tusks and tigers and, and all sorts of exciting things. So, um, you know, maybe dentistry doesn't sound that exciting at the surface. I find it very exciting and a wonderfully rewarding thing to do for my patients. But um, know that for you adrenaline junkies, there is such thing as being a zoo veterinary dentist um, and you get to do crazy things like go down into um, underground chambers with hibernating bears and do root canals on them, if that kind of thing sounds exciting to you. But I digress. Um, so if we have a dog with a, a tooth fracture down into the pulp, we can have a boarded veterinary dentist do a root canal. Um, a root canal tends to be more expensive than having a tooth extracted by a general practitioner. Um, but if finances allow, it can really be beneficial to the patient. Um, because they get to keep that tooth in their mouth and it will be functional for the patient. So in the case of a lower canine tooth, the tooth is still there to hold the tongue in the mouth. The tooth is still there to help that pet pick things up and, and chew their food and things like that. And root canal has a very, very high success rate. So they um, are successful more than 90% of the time. But the drawback is that this tooth needs to be x-rayed every six to 12 months for the remainder of that patient's life. And that means they go under general anesthesia for dental x-rays. And sometimes we see pets that have health conditions in addition to their dental disease. So here at the university hospital, I see a lot of pets with heart disease, with kidney disease, um, with other types of diseases that may not make having repeated anesthesia very safe for them. Um, we also wanna see these patients that get a root canal that their owners are able to brush their teeth at home um, in addition to bringing them in for these regular x-rays. So there's some special considerations with root canal. And if you want to see what a root canal looks like in a dog, so this is the uh, similar tooth to what I was showing the picture of the complicated crown fracture a couple of slides back. So this is an upper fourth premolar in a dog and it's showing the tooth that's fractured. And this one, wow, that pulp is just bulging out of there. That just makes me cringe to see how painful that must have been for this dog. And then we're using something called an endodontic file to be placed down. This tooth has three roots and we have to put a file down into each of the roots. And that file helps us pull out the blood vessel and the nerve. So a root canal, you can also think of it is it's a controlled death of the tooth. We're removing the living parts of the tooth and then we're filling it with a sealer and a inert substance that's kind of like rubber. It's called gutta percha, um, very similar to what's used in a person. And so in a root canal, we're basically killing the tooth, but we're leaving it there in a non-painful we're leaving it in a non-painful state at the end of the procedure, but it's still there to be functional for the patient. Um, so root canal is something that we do for dogs and cats. 
So I'm going to talk about a case that I saw. So uh, I'm spoiler alert here. She did not have a root canal because I treated her and I'm not a boarded veterinary dentist. So I do not do root canal. Um, but I was able to help this dog quite a bit. So this is Chloe and she's about an eight year old spayed female blue healer. And she had been having these skin wounds that you can see in this photo. They started out kind of closer to the end of her nose and they had started out four years prior to when I saw her. And they would go to the regular veterinarian and the wounds would go away with some antibiotics for a week or two. Um, but then they would always come back after several weeks. Um, and then the owners got really concerned because the wounds had started out kind of closer to the nose and then all of a sudden they were moving closer and closer to the eye and they were really worried about Chloe and, and thought, you know, we need a, another opinion on what's going on with this. So Chloe actually, when her owners called and made the appointment, they, uh, she got scheduled with our ophthalmology department because she had a wound near the eye. We thought maybe it was an eye problem. She went to the ophthalmology department and the ophthalmologist looked at it and went, uh, this is not a problem with the eye. I think we need somebody from our dentistry department. And luckily here, we've got lots of different people in lots of different areas of medicine. Um, so they came down the hallway and found me in dentistry. And the first thing I learned about Chloe is that she gets really nervous at the, at the veterinarian's office and she didn't want me to look at her mouth. So I decided first thing we would do for Chloe is give her some sedation. So we gave her some pain medication and anti-anxiety medication to allow us to closely examine her. So it allowed me to get a better close and better close up look at these wounds on her face and clean them up and measure them. And you can see, this is actually a dental probe here and the little markers on it are in millimeters. So this wound close to the eye was more than about 11 millimeters across. So pretty significant wound near the eye. And then when we looked in her mouth, this is what we found. Um, so this is what a normal dog mouth should look like. And this is the big upper canine tooth here. So if you look at the same tooth in Chloe, you'll notice that instead of having this nice tapered area at the end of the crown of the tooth, Hers is very blunted and it's also discolored. And then moving above the tooth, oh my goodness, what is this going on? We've got exposure of the root of that tooth. And so this tooth had been broken and infected for so long that the chronic infection and inflammation actually destroyed some of the soft tissue in her mouth and allowed this tooth root to be exposed. So uh, immediately found the source of the problem for Chloe and scheduled her to come back the very next day and have that tooth treated. So um, one of the things that I did the next day when I had Chloe under general anesthesia is, you know, what, one of the things in, in science where you can get yourself in trouble is, you know, you're looking at two things that appear to be associated, but you always want to have proof. So to have proof that these wounds on the face were associated with the um, broken tooth, I took a urinary catheter and put it through the wounds on the face and it came out in her mouth. Um, so then I knew that I was, my theory was correct and, and that the broken tooth was in fact causing these wounds on her face. And I was able to surgically extract that canine tooth. And this is what her mouth looked like at the end of the procedure. Uh, so I used some of the soft tissue from her lip and you can see all the sutures down here. Uh, so we cut out all of that unhealthy tissue and use healthy tissue from the inside of her lip to cover that area where that diseased tooth had been. The other thing I want you to notice about Chloe's mouth is look how many of her other teeth are also worn down. So this is a dog that was chewing on a lot of hard things. Um, and when I talked to the owner about it, they said, oh yeah, she likes to go out in the yard and chew on rocks. Um, and that can be a hard issue to deal with. So we had to figure out a creative way to keep Chloe out of the rocks so she didn't end up with more teeth that looked like that. 
Okay, I know I'm, I'm running it almost running into my question time here. So I'm going to really quickly talk about my tooth resorption case here. Uh, and then I'll leave some time at the end for questions. So tooth resorption, this is very, very different from a fractured tooth, but it's very, very common. So the word resorption in dentistry means that the hard part of the tooth, so the dentin that's in between the enamel and the pulp, actually is being destroyed by a type of cell called an odontoclast. Um, so this starts on a microscopic level, but it can eventually progress where the whole tooth is actually being destroyed by these odontoclasts. And this can be really, really painful because they can also result in the pulp of the tooth being exposed into the mouth. Um, so tooth resorption can actually be normal. So this is what is normally supposed to happen when you have baby teeth. Um, so this is actually one of my dog's litter mates. And this was one of his baby premolars and it fell out. So this tooth would normally have uh, two very long skinny roots on it. And this is a baby tooth that fell out. And my friend that owns this dog um, took this picture and sent it to me. And I just love it because I love teeth and I love Great Danes. <laughs> but you can see here, the root tissue has totally been destroyed. And it was just the very top of the tooth or what we call the crown of the tooth was left and it fell out and then it allowed the adult tooth to come behind it. So you all have had the same experience where you had baby teeth and then your tooth got wiggly. And then when it fell out, it was just this kind of, you know, it had some kind of a round hollow spot on the bottom of it. So the root got destroyed by the odontoclast and then it allowed the baby tooth to fall out and then your adult teeth can come in behind that. But tooth resorption is frequently not normal, um, especially in cats. This disease tends to be more frequent in cats. So almost two thirds of cats will probably have tooth resorption in, you know, 100% of them have tooth resorption in their baby teeth, but this is talking about it from a disease standpoint. Almost two thirds of cats will have this and it can be very, very painful. Uh, and we can also see teeth that break off because they get weakened and we can see secondary infection with the pulp that's exposed just like we saw in Chloe. Um, so this is little Cooper. Um, Cooper is also an eight-year-old beast, just like Chloe was, but he is a male cat. Um, his only significant medical history prior to the, his dental problems was that um, he had a urinary blockage, which is common in male cats too, but he had surgery to fix that and was doing great at the time that I saw him, other than um, this problem tooth. So when I opened Cooper's mouth and Cooper is about the sweetest cat and most cooperative guy that you could work with in the clinic setting. I opened his mouth and saw this big tooth resorptive lesion here on one of his lower molars. So that is actually pulp hanging out of that tooth. Ouch, just like Chloe. Oh my goodness, that has to hurt. Uh, so Cooper had had a dental procedure once before back in 2019. So this is an x-ray of that same tooth from 2019 and it looks happy and healthy. So when you're looking at this tooth, I'm gonna see if I can um, zoom in on this area a little bit for you. When you're looking at this tooth, you can see it's got this nice pulp cavity all the way through it. The dentin looks normal. It's looking really, really happy. It's got healthy bone around it. And then we're gonna compare that to the x-rays I took in February. And now this tooth has this big hole in the center of it. And then if you look at the roots, the roots really don't look quite the same anymore either. Um, so the pulp is all irregular. You can't really see the outline of this root very well anymore. So this is an example, unfortunately for Cooper, you know, the good thing is that his owner is a very astute fellow veterinarian and brought him in quickly when she noticed this problem. Um, but this tooth is very, very diseased and needs to be treated. Um, so what we did for Cooper was a combo combination procedure. So he had an extraction. There, that tooth has two roots and one of them was still healthy. So I was able to pull one root. I cut the tooth in half and pulled one root. And then the other root had been so resorbed that it was actually starting to turn to bone. And I did what's called a crown amputation. So amputation means to cut something off. 
Um, so I was actually able to use my dental drill just to cut off part of that tooth uh, because some of it had already been replaced by bone. But we removed all the parts of the tooth that were visible in the mouth and uh, that were causing him pain. So he went home a happy, sweet boy um, with no tooth that could get infected in his mouth. Okay, so now I'm gonna open it up for questions that you may have, and I'd love to hear anything that you're curious about, about veterinary dentistry, but also um, just about pets in general or school choices, things like that. Um, please feel free to chime in with any questions you may have. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up my shameless advertisement here for um, the K-State, some veterinary students um, have a program called Vet Med Rocks, and this is an enrichment program for middle school, high school, and college students. And there is gonna be an in-person option this summer, but also you can attend online for free. And it's usually really fun. Um, last year, I actually, I, I actually appeared in the Vet Med Rock Summer Program last year for the college students. Um, not that I'm advertising for myself, but you could see me or you might meet some other professors in the vet school and definitely meet some vet students that you can ask questions of and learn a little bit more about what it's like to be in our teaching hospital. Okay. Okay, so we had a question that said, could milk bones or pig ears be harmful for dog's teeth? And the answer to the milk bones, so your the milk bone brand makes lots of different treats. But if you're talking about just the traditional um, crunchy dog bones that you can kind of take and break into pieces, then no, that should not be able to break your pet's teeth. Um, pig ears, I don't typically see those being a problem from breaking the teeth, but I have had quite a few dogs that get vomiting and diarrhea from eating pig ears. Um, they can be really rich and or they might be contaminated with bacteria sometimes. So pig ears aren't necessarily something that I encourage people to feed their dogs, but not from a dental health standpoint. It's just because of the number of dogs that I've had to treat for stomach upset. Um, after eating pig ears, but they usually get uh, soft enough, they're cartilage, they're not true bone, that they'll usually soften up that they won't break, and break the teeth as the dog is chewing. And I don't know if I have the option of turning my camera around, but one other fun thing I can show you. So I am in a brand new conference room here in the Veterinary Health Center at K-State. I'm by myself, so I don't have a mask on. I'm still wearing a mask all the time um, when I'm around patients and clients and students. But um, we have just opened or, or we'll have our open house this Friday and then Monday we will welcome patients for the first time um, into our brand new pet health and nutrition center. Um, and you can kind of see it's a little bit of a mess right now, but you can see we have a brand new area of our hospital that we're so excited to get into because right now um, our small animal general medicine department uh, basically works out of a hallway. Um, it's it's an area about the size of my living room and dining room put together, which when you put four doctors and eight veterinary students into that space, um, plus you know eight or 10 dogs and cats, it gets really tight in there. So we have this wonderful, beautiful new space that we're gonna be moving into uh, next week. And if you either bring your pet here to be treated as a patient, or if you um, were to come to school here, you might get to see this. I'm gonna wander out here and see if I can show you an exam room. Okay. 
and hopefully I won't get myself locked out because they're still working out all the locks on the doors. <laughs> Uh, but here's one of our brand new dog exam rooms. So we're going to have a nice space. We've got a computer in each exam room, which will be nice because we're um, transitioning to have all of our medical records electronically. Um, we're just really excited about the updated space to, to offer our students. All right, no other questions? Nobody has burning questions about their dog or cat at home? I can't answer questions about your snake. I'm sure snakes can get broken fangs too, depending on what kind of snake you have. Well, if there are no other questions, this is Martha Nowak at K-State Olathe. Um, if there are no other questions, of course, you can put them in the chat box or you could unmute yourself if you wanted to. Um, and you could ask your question of Dr. Kaufman. But um, I want to invite people at this time. We, we do have a couple of minutes left if you want to ask your questions. Dr. Kaufman, while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions, I want to say thank you so very much for sharing uh, your expertise. Um, I find your pathway to your career, present career um, to be a, a very diverse one, starting with geology and, and going, still looking at minerals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just in a different, a living um, being, you know, how it's been incorporated. Um, but I just think it's uh, fascinating to listen to uh, veterinarians and, and anybody really, if you ask your adults around you or friends that are going through uh, a different pathway, it's, it's just interesting to find out what people find um, a different passion to their life uh, and to really enjoy their, their chosen career. I think it's very, very interesting. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and I don't see any other questions popping up in the chat box. Um, and I don't see any microphones that have been turned back on. So at this point, I just want to say thank you very, very much uh, for joining us and for spending uh, an hour of your very busy day uh, to make sure that our pets are uh, cared for uh, properly. And it is hard to find, I mean, they don't talk. So oh, you've got to read the body language and uh, find out if they are in pain or uncomfortable in some way. So thank you again for spending time. And yeah, thanks for having me. I will let you sign off. Okay. Bye guys. <laughs> All right, I will stop the recording and thank you again.